Today we turn from Matthew to Luke and step back a little bit in time to consider the first angelic annunciation of the Christmas story, the one made to the father of John the Baptist. Luke's account of Jesus' birth is much fuller than Matthew's with a rather lengthy build-up, including the birth of John, the forerunner and herald of Jesus, and two annunciations to Zechariah and Mary. The annunciation to Zechariah is less familiar to us because it's not usually included among the readings at Christmas or carol services, but John's birth plays an important role in Luke's account. In Luke 1, verses 5 to 25, John's birth is announced by an angel of the Lord to Zechariah the priest as he serves at the altar of the temple in Jerusalem. His wife, Elizabeth, he's told, will bear a son in spite of her old age, and Zechariah is to name him John. Because of his disbelief, Zechariah is struck dumb until John is actually born. Luke then tells us of the Annunciation of Jesus' birth to Mary and Mary's visit to Elizabeth, who is her relative, before John's birth takes place in verses 57 to 79. There Zechariah recovers his speech and pours out a prophecy inspired by the Holy Spirit, blessing God for sending his Messiah, a mighty saviour for us in the house of his servant David, and identifying John as Elijah, the forerunner, who will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. Both Mary's and Zechariah's songs of praise have been sung for centuries in Christian worship as Magnificat and Benedictus. Note first that Luke's account contains key references to the Old Testament. There are echoes, for example, of the birth of Isaac. Verse 7 recalls Abraham and Sarah. Like them, Zechariah and Elizabeth are old and advanced in years. Like Sarah, Elizabeth is barren. And the wording of Zechariah's unbelieving question in verse 18 is almost an exact quotation of Abraham in Genesis 15 verse 8. Here is another child given by God against all expectations with huge implications for God's purposes and his people. In verses 72 and 73 Zechariah specifically mentions God's fulfilment of his promises to Abraham, a theme we saw in the genealogy in Matthew. In verses 16 and 17, the angel spells out John's role in terms of the predictions of Malachi 3, 1 and 4, 5 and 6, that before the day of his coming, the Lord would send the prophet Elijah to prepare a people prepared for the Lord. In verse 76, the connection with Elijah is reinforced by Zechariah's words that John will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. The angel is identified in verse 19 as Gabriel who appears elsewhere only in Daniel 8 and 9. Noting various similarities between Luke and Daniel, the New Testament scholar Raymond Brown writes that Luke intends us to see a parallel between Gabriel's appearance to Daniel and his appearance to Zechariah. In Daniel, Gabriel appeared to tell in advance the future history of Israel under the rule of Persia and Greece, which will be a time of tribulation and distress. Now he appears to Zechariah to tell of great joy and gladness at the birth of one who will be great in the eyes of the Lord and be filled with the Holy Spirit 
even from his mother's womb. Brown notes further that in verses 23 and 24, Zechariah going home and Elizabeth conceiving later echoes the account of the parents of Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 1. In verse 25, Elizabeth's remark about the Lord taking away her disgrace echoes the words of Rachel in Genesis 30 verse 23. The neighbours and relatives rejoicing at her son's birth is reminiscent of both Isaac's birth and Obed's birth to Ruth. In verse 68, Zechariah speaks of God having visited and redeemed his people, language which recalls the story of the exodus from Egypt. In verse 69, mention of a horn of salvation in the house of his servant David uses an expression taken from 2 Samuel 22, 3 and Psalm 132, 17. Finally, in verse 80, Luke's comment about John that the child grew and became strong in spirit echoes what was said about Samuel in 1 Samuel 2.21. The link with Samuel is especially suggestive. Just as Samuel prepared the way for the great King David, so John will prepare the way for great David's greater son. Again, we have the note of fulfilment. The Old Testament story is now reaching its climax. Note secondly that Luke's account focuses on the one who is to come after John. Luke tells us of the Annunciation of John's birth, then the Annunciation of Jesus' birth and Mary's visit to Elizabeth, then the birth of John and finally the birth of Jesus. The birth of John is not important in itself but only because it's part of the preparation for Jesus' birth which is the climax of the whole sequence. Luke includes the rather long account about John in order to build up our expectations for the coming of Jesus after him. As the forerunner, John foreshadows Jesus. For example, his circumcision and naming on the eighth day in verse 59 exactly parallels that of Jesus in chapter 2, verse 21, just as in the rest of the Gospel, John's preaching and his execution will prefigure the preaching and the execution of Jesus. Again, what Zechariah says about John serves to highlight the importance of the one who is to come after him. In verse 76, John's role as a prophet is to go before the Lord to prepare his ways. The implication is that while John is to be the prophet of the Lord, the one to come after him will be the Lord himself. If John is to prepare the way for the Lord and Jesus is the one who comes after him, then who must Jesus be? As Raymond Brown observes in verses 78 and 79, Zechariah's song makes clear that the saving action for Israel comes not from the Baptist, but from the Lord before whom the Baptist prepares the way. The Baptist is mentioned first, but Jesus is the one who guides out from darkness and death. In verse 68, Zechariah's blessing of the Lord God of Israel echoes several of the Psalms, but more significantly, it echoes 1 Kings 1 verse 48, where David, at the anointing of his son Solomon as his successor, says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has allowed my eyes to see a successor on my throne today. God had promised David that he would raise up his offspring to succeed him 
and would establish his throne forever. Although Solomon was David's first successor, the promise could never be fulfilled in him. But the one who is now to come after John will be the final successor of David's line. And he will fulfill the promise of an eternal kingdom in spiritual rather than political terms. And then note finally that Luke's account effectively bridges the gap between the Old Testament and the New. It begins in verses 5 and 6 with a couple who are both descendants of Moses' brother Aaron and who exemplify faithfulness to the covenant and obedience to its law. The action starts at the altar of incense in the sanctuary of the house of the Lord with an angelic appearance to a priest. The events that follow and the songs of praise that interpret them are full of parallels with significant Old Testament events and references to the fulfilment of Old Testament promises and prophecies. We shall see this again in the Annunciation to Mary of the birth of her son. So John the Baptist marks the turning point from the time of the Old Testament to the time of the New. Jesus himself will declare later in chapter 16, verse 16, that the law and the prophets were until John. From then, the kingdom of God is being preached. John's parents belong very firmly to the old, but the child given to them will announce the coming of one who ushers in the new. As in Matthew, what is unfolding is not something brand new, but the continuation of the long history of God's work in the world through his chosen people, Israel.